Fletcher. <laughs> and giving the performance of a lifetime, please welcome Karen Edgerton. <laughs> With the way that this film has has been so embraced, and and the way that this movie has touched so many people, and the the commitment that you both have given to to make this movie so different from the traditional formulaic biopic, like how how does how proud are you that the movie you know since it premiered in Cannes back in May that the movie still continues to elicit this kind of a response? <laughs> Uh, me? You first. <laughs> go on, love, you go first. All right. Um, it's, it's not easy to put into words, but I think it's what you say, you know, since we came out in May, which is seven long months ago, how long yeah. ago is that? Six, seven? Crazy. You know, to, to still be here and see, like, the full theatre and have you guys stand up when, you know, when <laughs> we come in and, and, and just the reaction from it, I stood and watched the last 10 minutes there with you guys because that's always such a thrill but uh, it, it's, it's really hard to just go oh yeah it's really nice it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's way beyond that it's, it's sort of yeah it's just beautiful it's really lovely because you know you, you kind of feel the, the appreciation and the, and the warmth and affection for the film which kind of feels like it could be five years later and if that was the case you know that Somewhere, you know, five years down the line, they show the film, and people go, oh, "I'm going to go see it just to have that big screen experience." It's it's really hard to put into words. How about for your terrible words? Yeah, you know, I think when you when you when you spend so much time making something, and particularly something like Rocket Man, you know, it's it's a really personal, really emotional experience, and it's the movie that we were excited by and we were moved by the idea of and that, but when you're making it that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be what everyone else finds exciting and what everyone else finds moving and so you know and also it's such a for us it's such a special episode in our lives and so when the movie that we were excited and made emotional by has the same effect on a room full of people we don't know that's a really magical feeling and um, and it's you know, and it's hugely, hugely validating and rewarding. So thank you for being here, and thank you for watching it, and thank you for um, for supporting it. It really. Means well. thank you. And that's the since it really has now now it's on. I'm entertaining on Blu-ray. That's a plug. Uh, <laughs> you know. Watch it uh, from the comfort of my, you know, 65-inch uh, TV right. um, to to really just see how the musical numbers feel like they stand alone. Mm -hmm. Like each musical number has its own identity. So, what were the challenges to do that for both of you? And what were the challenges, just in general, to make a film about someone like Elton John and make it feel? unique and not a traditional biopic? Well, I don't think we ever approached it like a biopic. I think we asked it like a list of music. Your question is that we approached it like a musical, you know, and and that's why Taron sings everything that you hear, because if you were to... Oh, yeah. 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 go to the theatre and see a Broadway show, you would expect the person to come out on stage and see. This is no different. We, we never approached it in any different way. And um, we knew that we had something special when we approached it in this way with that entrance where he comes in and essentially says, I'm an alcoholic, I want to get better. And I've got to examine my life. And so it's an examination of a life through someone in the first person. It's not a sort of third person biopic. <laughs> kind of, oh, this happened, that happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, it happened by the... We jump around all over the place, you know, if we to tell our own personal stories, we'd 
you know, we sort of dip in and out all over the place. And, and so that gave the film a freedom and a fantasy and an imagination that kind of lent itself to, to being authentic to help them. That's what we always felt. Um, and that's why that was always exciting. And, and therefore the numbers take on their own identity in that way. The, the, the thing about the two of you working with Taylor before, for Eddie the Eagle, uh, you know, yes, Eddie the Eagle. <laughs> How does that comfort level sort of like free you a little more to do, to do something so challenging and so daring, and something like you've never done before, the trust? Yeah, I think it's, you know, it, it, it is partly that, the bit of experience we've had together, but it's more, it's more just to do with the fact that we really, really enjoy each other's company we make each other laugh i think we both like the same things and we both get excited by the same types of work and and um yeah i don't know you know dex i feel very creative when i'm with dex and when we're working together and and i feel like also i know although dex has got a really lovely blend of knowing what he wants but also being very open to being taken in directions that he doesn't necessarily expect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's a really healthy great place I think for a director to be in and and I don't know we have a, we we I don't know you know there's there's a tremendous amount of planning and work and ideas that came and went when we were making Rocky mm -hmm. but also I think we find the time to to make play and fun are part of what we do and that and I think that's that's part of what we do well together and it's part of our shared creative process mm -hmm. and I don't know I'm not making sense am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a good time. I think we have a good time and I think we just I think we feel I think we're a good team. I think and we both feel that when we're working and and we're not afraid to be honest with each other but I think we're also Excited by each other, crazy. What the possibilities are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Dexter, when you first came on board to do this, when you first envisioned, you know, how you were going to make this movie, and you were going to make a film about it, Taryn, were you were you on board yet? Like, who was first? Who came first? It yeah. all kind of happened fairly. At, you know, as you said, Dexter and I made this movie, Eddie the Eagle, and and it was, you know, it all kind of it wasn't like. You know, Dex was looking at other actors, and I was suggesting other directors. It all just sort of happened, and it was. I think for both of us, there was never any. There was no one else. You know, it was just. It was all put together around us, and and it felt like a good, good. It felt like a good. Yeah, it felt like it was meant to be. We'd made this movie, Eddie the Eagle, and I had had a really good time doing it, and that was in no small part due to Dex. You know, and and. And I, I think we both felt that we loved making that movie and we're so proud of it as this buddy comedy, sports, oh, feel-good movie. Yeah. But I think, in honesty, I think we both felt coming out of it that we had something with a little bit more... I think we, had a, we felt like we had another movie in us that was maybe a little bit more complex. I don't mean that in any way negatively about Eddie the Eagle because, as I say, we're both fiercely proud of it, but we felt that maybe we had another outing that was a bit more challenging in a different way, and, that, and that, that, that's mm. Rocket Man's approach. So, so the question is, like, when, so this sort of just sort of happened organically, which it really sounds like it did. So, like, you know, did you ever, like, just sort of take a minute and go, hmm, yeah, I'm going to tell you all the job. Yeah, 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 a bit. Oh, hang on, that's <laughs> What? <laughs> you know, you at that moment. I, I, I mean, I've got to say, you know, when, when the discussion started happening, to me it was like, that's a genius idea. Taron playing Yelp, and it just, because I think it goes back to what Taron was saying, we were looking for something that, you know, we, I think we see it as a progression, you know, it's not kind of like we did Eddie and that's our first outing and then Elton is something more grown up and a, kind of a, a, a bit more thoughtful and, and complex and I, it just seemed like a really good next logical step. It didn't seem like, oh my God, when I play Elton, we've got out of our depth. It's like, we've got to take this on. It's an absolutely brilliant challenge that we relished, you know, and, and great talent gets to use his voice. That's another element to what we've done before, what, what he's done before it. There was nothing, of, of course, it's all daunting. Don't give me, there's not one day when he doesn't turn up and go, He's got to do something completely different from what he did yesterday on on on, on Rocket Man. There's no two things. See the film. It's like, where's he going next? I mean, he's not. You know, he's far from consistent. And and 
Um, so it's you know what I mean. It's all it's always always a challenge. But I think that was something that we were like. That's what got us really excited. That's what Taron came up with something new. He'd obviously been turned. I don't know when he ever slept because he, you know, he's coming up with this new idea for the day. And I go in and make that trailer and see him shave his head and stick teeth on him and do all sorts of different things and hot pants and God knows what was wearing each day. But, but, and, and, and then amazing stuff would come out of it because it was never, oh, right, okay, we just, it's one of those days when you, yeah, it was all right, oh, right, okay. But we didn't have time to think about it. But when you're when you're playing someone like Elton John, who's you know, first of all, he's not subtle. Uh, he's been very, very, very open, and you know, whether it's through his music or through interviews. I mean, you just read a biography. Uh, you know, he his his landmark interview with Rolling Stone, I think it was in '76, where he came out. So he's he's been very forward uh, with everything. But having said that, what is your point of connection to to play your version of someone who is so well known? Like, how do you wrap your head around it and not imitate the guy, but play a human being? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, you've got a great script and, you know, and that's a series of scenes and there are a series of situations and you play each scene and each moment as honestly and as authentically as you can. And, you know, it's, acting's all about imagination. You know, I've never been to, I've never been to rehab. But I can imagine what that might feel like. I can talk to people who have, some of them who are near to me, and, and try and gain as complete a picture as possible of what that is. And I can totally imagine what it would be like to really want to have sex with Richard Madden. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's a really attractive, good-looking guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, you know, these are all they're all they're all leaps of the imagination, but they're not. You know, it's not leaping over the Grand Canyon. Um, and I think you just don't. You know, I think you can't go into it thinking, "Oh my, we're making a movie about Elton John. We've got to capture the magnitude of everything that is this iconic." You know, the the. You know, I mean, he was just voted the number one solo male artist you can't be thinking about that all day every day when you're making the movie about it you'd lose your fucking mind <laughs> but you, you know but you, what you do is you're aware of it in the sense that you respect it and it's the reason you're there because you're paying tribute to a great artist but you know the movie was never about sort of trying to you know capture him in all his perfection and uh, and kind of glorious majesty it's about showing a a person at their most vulnerable and a person both at their peaks and their troughs. And I think what's really cool about Rocket Man is, and that title track specifically in the movie, is that we show him at a peak and a trough simultaneously. And yeah, that's what the movie is about, you know. It's yeah. about, it's just, it's showing you a peak behind <clears throat> what your perception can be of someone, you know, uh, in a... It's an ex two extremes at the same time. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Wow. But, um... I don't really know. We approached it with great care and lots of thought and creativity, um, and and you know, and, and trusted that when I mean I trusted that when Dex put it all together, it would be really good. <laughs> when I was, <laughs> when I, was uh, I was reading an interview that that Ron Howard had given about the documentary he made about the Beatles touring years, and the only advice he got from Paul McCartney was just. He said, you know what, back in those days when we were touring, we were, we were good friends and we loved each other. Well, all the fighting didn't come until later. Mm -hmm. So just, just if you could focus on the love that we had, the brotherhood, mm -hmm. that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. So did you have any kind of sort of conversation with Elton about sort of what he, what he would like this movie to be, sort of the, the, the sort of vibe, the projection, the idea of, of what he hoped we, we, we come across in the movie. Did he ever say to you, "This is what I would love people to sort of take away with this movie," or did he give you complete freedom? Um, he, he he did give complete freedom. I don't think. I think as the filmmaker, as the filmmakers, we have to interpret what that what that story is about, what what it speaks to us to, uh, about, and and it's really difficult for Elton to comment on what he thinks it is because. Um, for us, it's first, first most about him being a survivor. 
you know, he survives extraordinary times and extraordinary emotional highs and lows. And and for him to go make a film about me being a survivor doesn't ring true. It doesn't. It's not for him to sort of say in a way. And I think this was the genius of what he did is that he let us interpret what was good and bad and interesting and dynamic and dramatic and exciting about his story our own way. He looked at everything that we did and we talked about everything in depth and he'd tell you anything you want to know. But it was for us to see him as a person as much as we humanly could in that process and then get that out there in the most authentic way that we could. It's part of the beauty of Taron's great friendship and relationship with him. Part of how he communicates that, how I talk to him and what I understand him to be. It, and, and, and all of us across the creative spectrum of the film. And, and I think that's what's really strong about, even though Elton is the producer, he's not like over it. You right. know, he's sort of went, go, do you know what I mean, Taron? It's like. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's, I think sometimes when you're making a movie, not that I've got a great deal of experience of it, but I think sometimes the perception of making a movie about someone's life, let's call it a biopic, for the sake of making the point, that you're sort of trying to reach for some perfect iteration of it that was exactly what happened, and it's an exact carbon copy, and somehow that is the greatest um, thing you can aspire to creatively, is for it to be exactly as it was. Yeah. And that is just not the movie we made. What you see, you know, we don't know what the layout backstage at the Troubadour was like. Frankly, we don't care, you know. We wanted right. to, we, it's, the, what you see up there is what we imagine it might have been like with a bit of movie pixie dust in it because it's good, because it's going to be, you know, so, you know, that bit of the movie, I, it's probably as bad as near as it ever gets to fast where I'm kind of, you know, having a bit of a histrionic backstage. You know, I don't think Elton, men, you know, I'm sure lots of Elton's tantrums weren't that funny, you know, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but it it felt right for that moment. So mm. I just think that we aren't, we, we, we're not, well, I think we just very openly not subscribe to that idea that we're trying to, Make something that's, uh, you know, a documentary. It's a, it's yeah. a reimagining. Everything you see is our, it's in, it's inter, it's an interpretation of his story, and you know, Elton said in an inter, in an article that he penned in the UK, you know, said not everything in the movie is fact, but it is the truth, and I just thought that was a lovely way of putting it because, you know, it is that the spirit of Elton and Bernie's relationship, which is the beating heart of the movie, is absolutely truthful to who they are, and I know because I've spent time around them both, and I've read letters between them, and, you know, read accounts of what they were like, but, but no, you know, that isn't the exact cafe they were in, you know, and it's not the exact name of the cafe either, I don't think, you know, it's, you know but it's, but because, I think because, I think because we've embraced that, and made it part of the, stylist, the stylistic choice of the film, it doesn't then feel like a cop out or like we just haven't done our research because it's something we've owned as a stylistic choice and that was it is frightening but you know people love it, people get it and that's um and that's something that really emerged as we made the film as well the more we went on the more that relationship emerged the more Jamie and 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 Taron worked together and found this kind of beating heart of it I was like, this is where the film lies. This is what it is, isn't it? And I can't honestly say, I was like, I'm making a film about two guys who just love each other. <laughs> it, 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 you know, it, it found its voice. It found its way. And, and that was part of the joy of it. There was things that found their way through. And, and that, yeah, that's what made it kind of exciting. You know, when, when you have, when you're preparing to do, you know, your rehearsal, whatever, and then you've got magic time, you know, with the production design, the wardrobe, the hair, the makeup. How does that elevate your performance, especially on the on the on the the bigger scenes, and maybe the musical ones? How does that like bring out the magic in you that you didn't even know you had? Um, I, you know, I mean, I think it's always really exciting seeing anyone's design on a film set. You know, it's all a kind of symbiotic, organic process, and you know, there are of course departments because it would be carnage and chaos otherwise but ultimately you're all feeding and contributing to one thing which is the film and 
and you know if you're in the right space creatively you just constantly feel excited by what everyone brings you and of, of course you know the aesthetic of a character feeds into it and um, and helps transport you to that place where you are, are imaginatively somewhere else but equally you know the environment Marcus's design every element of it you know is of course you know you can't you couldn't do it in a vacuum it would be like a weird piece of sort of Austere physical theatre, yeah, wouldn't yeah, it? You know, I mean, like you—it's—it's it's all part of a whole, and you—and no one can, ex- no, you know, no one part of the filmmaking team can exist without another. Mm, yeah, and and what what it really works well is when the detail of what those departments do become really quickly sort of engaging for the actor. You know, it's like you know very quickly when you go into that room that is your your childhood home. There's a detail in there that someone has kind of put in there that you gravitate towards and it just clicks and resonates yeah. with what your your detail is. You know, it's really it, good filmmaking creativity comes from in, in the detail of it, you know, and, and it's what you gravitate towards and, and what you you know, the stuff that you don't that isn't any use to kind of pass by. But in the costume, you know, uh, and, and in the in the house and the design, I'm not sort of articulating it well, but they're the things that sort of marry it all together, and it, it does. It takes the act of sort of never and go. Oh, that's good. I, I get something from that. That feeds, you know, what I'm, I'm, I'm building. So, so obviously, you and Elf John got pretty tight. I mean, you had met before, and you sang one of the songs in the movie Sing. So, so when he had a birthday recently, uh, what did you give him? I gave him. Oh yeah, I gave him the glasses from your song. Um, the ones that I wear when writing your song, I had his prescription for them, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you text each other and say, hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. It's no, longer, it's, it's no longer that weird to me, yeah. isn't that strange? Which is weird in itself, but uh, yeah. I sent him a video earlier, a few hours ago, of, um, uh, Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell jamming yeah. and he emailed back I won't tell you what he says <laughs> <laughs> can't repeat a lot of what Elton says <laughs> uh, what was the uh, artist a musical number to film uh, they are all hard to film <laughs> there's some that are an absolute joy your song being particularly right because that is sung live on the day on the set it's recorded there and then okay. the music is added <laughs> I you know there's another one where he seems don't let the sun go down on me which him and Celinda seems a beautiful actress is it I thought that was particularly hard because it's so emotional that moment and it's such a big song and and of course, you know, there's stuff that's choreographed and it's lots of moving parts and lots of people and cameras going on and off of brains and running around. But all the technical guys, we we love all that sort of stuff. That's like, you know, you run it and run it, it's good, and oh, the camera's off, and it's got like, oh, yeah. Boys with toys. Yeah, yeah, yeah you'll watch it seven, let's do it again. We don't need to go, oh, come on, let's do it. But, but the, the, the more sort of like, the voice cracking, emotional moments where the song and the voice and the actor really need to do some really intense, dramatic stuff. That, that it can be easily underestimated, I think. You know, I think Don't Let the Sun Go Down on Me is a really amazing moment. If you watch what's going on there, it's a guy with one note on a piano. Ding, ding, you know, and letting that voice cut through and her uh, looking through him through, through a studio window. And it's... It's seemingly very simple, but for me, I think that's some of the hardest stuff. So, you know, before I saw the film, before I was getting, you know, I knew I was going to see the film, I thought for sure that this particular song would be in the movie. I think you all might know what song I'm talking about, but it wasn't there. I was wondering if it was filmed and then cut or just not filmed at all. Someone saved my life tonight. Uh, Taron yeah. doesn't like that song anyway. <laughs> uh, it's no, it is my favourite. I love it. Um, yeah, it's not. It didn't have a. It just didn't have a place. I mean, they've written like. Oh, they've got like five hundred songs or something insane, you know. And, uh, 
I'm sure not sure all of them are classics, but um, but you know, I mean, I don't think you could get everything in there because they have so many incredible songs, you know. And that one that just wasn't. Yeah, I mean, we're sort of in a different lane from. Yeah, what two other girls? I think that's the yeah, thing. It's yeah. the, it's a beautiful song because it's it's Bernie, it's Elton singing Bernie lyrics, which Bernie wrote about Elton. Yeah, and it's uh, I mean, I just. From a from a musical perspective, in terms of melody, it's gorgeous. And yeah. I love the sort of kitchen sink pedestrianness of it. You know, East End nights, smuggy lights, curtains drawn. But it's also it's a bit the story of the film, isn't it? So unless it's kind of unless yeah, you're going to yeah. do it in a sort of I did, I know what you're getting at because I did pitch it to Dex at one <laughs> point, but it, it only could have been. I pitched it at the end of the movie and it couldn't be anywhere else because it has to be, because it's reflective. But it wouldn't have, it, w- it, it doesn't, you know, what purpose does it serve other than right, to be reflective? Correct. And re- reflection is inherently a, a slight, it's not, I don't mean it's an indulgence, but I mean it's, you're not actually doing anything. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't serve it's a storytelling yeah. purpose. It's a passive thing. It's not an active it's thing, exactly. It's so thing. as much as I would love to sit here and congratulate myself on my genius <laughs> idea, I th- Dexter is absolutely right to completely disregard <laughs> No, 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 but do you tell? now. <laughs> what, me? Okay. Uh, no, but it is, it's a different strand in the film as well. It, it is really about Elton and his survival and his personal relationship with with his issues. And, and that would have really made it about just solely Bernie saving him. And it wasn't, we needed to look at how Elton saved himself and how he said, I'm still standing. And the, Which is fairly on the nose as well, if you look at it. I mean, we just mm-hmm. didn't interpret it yeah, to totally. me. But we celebrate that. We go, yeah, it's great. This is what it should be. It's there anyway. So. Yeah, and... and I suppose we could have stuck it in the scene where he's writing different songs and that guy's going, what's that? Rubbish! Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, boring! And, you know, there's... Dick James. There's, yeah, Dick James, but... Uh, Listen to it in the car on the way home. <laughs> there you go. It okay. is lovely. He's got questions. Someone's got a question. Yes, your question. What is your question? You, yeah, you, with the finger. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, musical, um, and it was a cameo by Giles Martin, and I was just wondering what... I mean, obviously he comes from, he's the fifth Beatle, his father. And so I'm wondering how or what influence he had on either a musical performance of yours singing or in the movie itself as a, because there's so much music. What was his contribution? I mean, look, you know, I mean, yes. I mean, I mean, fucking enormous. Like, you know, I mean, like, like you know, it, it, you know, I mean, the movie's made by hundreds of people, but if I if I talk about the absolute nucleus of it, it I would say it feels like me, Dex and Giles. I mean, also George shot it, and then you know, and of course everybody, everybody is crucial and integral. But if I was to talk about the absolute centre of it, yeah, yeah. just if you know, if you had to put three people in a room, the nucleus <laughs> of it, Giles is Giles. You know, Giles is a, a huge part of this movie, and and uh, Giles who. Giles Martin, Giles Martin, Martin uh, you who's know, the son of son of George Martin, George Martin, who produced the Beatles records, but um, uh, but he, but you, you know, just in so many different ways, in terms of uh, not purely just from a kind of a recording perspective, but in terms of us, the three of us discussing it creatively, because it's so symbiotic. The action, the, the the drama, and the songs all kind of bleed into one thing, so they all they're all informed by one another and. And just in terms of nurturing me as a singer and making me, getting me used to Abbey Road and, and all of that kind of, all the paraphernalia of recording, which if you're not a recording artist, is, is, it's, it's a lot, you know? And um, look, you know, he's, he's, he's a, yeah, I, can't, I mean, I, I've run out of superlatives. Yeah, right? it's, it's, it's hard to put in words what contribution he made because it's so massive. Absolutely, and, yeah. And, and even to the extent of his in the understanding of how rock stars function on the day-to-day yeah, basis. Exactly, exactly, I mean, yeah. the, the, you know, the psychology of a rock star is, and you, you, we could go to him and he would talk about things, but even his ability to um, to interpret what it is that we were trying to dramatically achieve 
and then go musically go, oh no, actually it's a different thing. And he'll be able to change gear with us and shift off into a, a different musical direction and come with a different version. It's like, I can tell you there's 15 to 20 different versions of Saturday Night Live for fighting that, that we went through. Or, 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 so, or, or um, you know, don't let the sun go down on me. He, he had to be adaptable because it's not our world. And, and so we're... As much as that frees us, it also makes us probably very frustrating because we're like, oh no, let's do it this way, completely different. But he, you know, he would be able to to help facilitate that, and 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 also Elton trusted him because the first time I met I met Elton, I went with Giles. I was like, you know, oh, Elton wants to have lunch. He's in Vegas. Come with Giles, and so I went with Giles, and Giles just sat there, sort of like <laughs> laughing, and, and you know he's seen that one all his life. He's known him since he was twelve. It's no, and, and for me, you know, I suppose yeah. it felt like I had two lives as an actor. I had my life on set with Dex, and then I had my life in studio with Giles. And of course, the lines crossed a lot, but it was like two worlds. And so I don't think it would be go to you know. He's the musical director, so mm-hmm. you know, it, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. I, I, I think we've answered. And he's an amazing producer. <laughs> yeah. And all that, everything he's, he yeah. produced it all. It's amazing. It's amazing. Re-recorded it all personally. You know, I mean, the te- the tens of hundreds of hours. He put you were at Abbey Road. <laughs> Abbey Road, and also Air Studios as well in in, yeah. in Hampstead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it was really cool. It, well, recently, um, he held an event there for the. For the um, the release of the remastered Abbey Road, wasn't it? Abbey Road record, and yeah. we went down and we met Paul. Paul and Ringo. Poor thing. Yeah. What did Paul say to me? I said to him, um, he said, "Oh, hey." And I was like, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like "Oh, hi." He meant I loved the film. It was great. <laughs> And, uh, and I went, oh, thanks. And, you know, I was with my best mate, Blair, and I went, I went, you know, we came to see you when we were 20, 10 years ago at Hyde Park, um, and we cried. And he went, you know, the really strange thing is, we never set out to make anybody cry. <laughs> <laughs> and then my mate, Blair, and I, he sort of looked a bit un- upset. And then my mate, Blair, went, I mean, it was fucking rocking as well. <laughs> and, he went, and then Paul went, oh, great, that's good. Great. <laughs> and then sort of so walked off. It was like the most surreal, weird thing. <laughs> okay, that is the greatest story in the world. And with that, two quick uh, recommend, uh, suggestions, uh, uh, if you could help us out. Uh, stay seated while we exit, so we can uh, bolt to another thing. And also, please... Do continue to spread the word about Rocket Man, Dexter Foster, and Oh my God, your Paul story is amazing, <laughs> dude. That is extremely cool.